Oh yeah? Oh yeah? Yeah. Then who's dropping the bombs? Right. <laughs> November 9th, 1940. Italy has invaded Greece, but already after just a few days, that invasion stalls. So what will Italy's German ally do? Adolf Hitler decides to come to the rescue. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Italy invaded Greece and Germany made its last daylight bombing raid on Britain, though nighttime ones will continue. On November 3rd, though, there is no raid on London at all. This is the first time since September 7th. That's 57 straight days. An average of 165 planes each night, dropping 13,600 tons of high explosive bombs, as well as incendiaries, on major British cities, not just London. In those night attacks, with Britain's underdeveloped night defenses, the Luftwaffe lost just 75 planes, most by accidents. Still, on the 6th, a German Luftwaffe Enigma message is sent out with instructions that some of the machinery needed to equip the invasion barges in French and Belgian ports is to be put in storage. British Signals Intelligence picks this up, and by the evening, British High Command can now be 100% certain that German plans do not include an invasion of Britain, at least not for any foreseeable future. Remember, though, that the Battle of Britain is only using a small fraction of Germany's military resources. For the rest of them, a phony war is settling in, much like that in Britain and France last winter. The difference now is that the German soldiers suddenly have a ton more stuff from all of the conquered territory. Food and wines and silk stockings. And it's a good thing for Germany that it has some time now to replenish the tanks and planes and ammunition used in all the battles of the first year of the war. This winter, they're also doing an expansion program. The army is to grow from 5.7 million to 7.3 million men. And they're really going to need stuff like railway cars from France for Hitler's future plans. But what are they? Well, I've talked about this before. On the one hand, he wants to invade the USSR in May. On the other hand, he wants to consolidate in the West and invade Britain. On the other hand, Hitler had three hands. He's got a navy that wants to drive the British from Gibraltar, Suez, and the Mediterranean. But while Germany is expanding and replenishing, the British might be doing that too. See, on the 5th, Franklin Roosevelt wins an unprecedented third American presidential term over Wendell Wilkie. His Democratic Party also keeps its majority in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Just 48 hours after winning re-election, Roosevelt talks with Arthur Purvis, the head of the British purchasing mission in Washington. They talk about what sort of arms and supplies the British will need to field an army of 55 divisions by mid-1942, such an army not being possible to equip without a lot of American aid. Roosevelt says his rule of thumb is to make munitions and arms available to Britain on a 50-50 basis. He even wants to build 300 merchant ships for Britain. Thing is, because of the neutrality acts, military commerce has been running on the cash and carry system, which I talked about last fall. But Britain's at war, and cash reserves, and even credit, aren't going to last indefinitely, and you can't do cash and carry with no cash. Roosevelt has the idea that the US will pay to build the ships and then just rent them or loan them to Britain, thus circumventing cash and carry sales. This could also maybe be extended to cover things other than ships. It could replace all sorts of arms and munition purchases, lending or leasing them instead. Well, it's just an idea at the moment. I imagine we'll see if they follow up on it in the future. To get supplies though, they would have to cross the Atlantic and that's not a very safe place at the moment where on the 5th, the Admiral Scheer, having reached the Atlantic through the Straits of Denmark two weeks ago, finds shipping convoy HX-84, 37 ships strong. The convoy, at this part of its journey, has only a single armed merchant cruiser protecting it, the Jervis Bay. That ship is heavily outgunned, but its captain, Edward Fagan, engages the Scheer so the convoy can scatter. The Scheer does sink the Jervis Bay, but 32 of the convoy ships manage to escape. One of the most damaged ships, the San Demetrio, is set ablaze and abandoned by the crew. They recite their ship the next day though and board it and with no navigational equipment, manage to get the ship and its oil to Britain. It becomes a media event. 
There's also action in the Mediterranean this week. Operation MB8 begins this week. This is a complicated series of British naval operations and maneuvers. Operation Coat brings troops and AA guns to Malta, covered by ships from Force H out of Gibraltar. The aircraft carrier Ark Royal veers off from that to attack Cagliari in Operation Crack. Three protected convoy operations, two going both directions between Malta and Alexandria, and one to reinforce Greece, are also part of MB8. The main operation is Operation Judgment, though, which is getting together now, and which I'll talk about next week. Further to the south in Africa, there's plenty to talk about this week. William Slim's 10th Indian Brigade captures Galabat from the Italians, but is forced to withdraw the 7th, and the Italians reoccupy it. The goal was actually Matema, beyond Galabat, and the Galabat region now becomes one of skirmish and no man's land. There has also been fighting at Tehamian Wells, north of Kasala. This was also fighting to a standstill, but it served a purpose. Gazelle force at the wells, though unable to reduce the Italian colonial battalions in front of it, forced them in the end to withdraw from the Sudan and establish that clear superiority of no man's land that gave us the initiative in all future operations. Also in Africa, there are free French landings under overall command of Colonel Philippe Leclerc north of Libreville. Libreville Aerodrome is bombed the 9th. There is some scattered fighting over the next few days, but spoiler, Libreville falls the 10th and French Equatorial Africa comes over to the Free French. But what's going on north of the Mediterranean, specifically Italy's invasion of Greece? Well, it's going poorly from the beginning of the week. The Italian spearhead through the Pindus Mountains is surrounded from all sides the third. Relief cannot get through. This day and the fourth, Samarina and Bovosa are recaptured by the Greeks. The Italians are pushed back for the rest of the week, where, as the week ends, the Italian 3rd Alpini Division is trapped in and around Pindus Gorges. The Greeks take 5,000 prisoners. Italian General Sebastiano Prasca has ordered his troops on the defensive along the whole 140-kilometer front. So as the Battle of Elia Kalamas ends, so too does the Italian offensive in Greece. Just after that, Prasca is dismissed as commander. He will be replaced in a few days by Ubaldo Sodu. Meanwhile, Britain's RAF sets up small bases in the Peloponnese, near Athens, and on the Gulf of Corinth. Requests for large bases near Salonika are resisted, though, and such bases would, in fact, put the British in position to bomb the Romanian oil fields, Germany's main source of oil. Adolf Hitler is by now losing what little confidence he had in the Italian fighting ability. So on the 4th, he has OKW prepare operational plans for a German invasion of Greece. On paper, the Italians should have overrun the Greeks right away, or should they have? The Greeks are outnumbered, sure, and they have to split their forces to defend both Epirus and Thrace, but the Italians also have to split their forces because they need a lot of men for the fight in Abyssinia and Libya. Mussolini had also reduced the size of his units to increase their number. They were weaker than their Greek equivalents. They were also weaker in motivation. Mussolini's reasons for seeking war with Greece went no further than a desire to emulate his German allies' triumphs, settle trifling old scores with Greece, reassert Italy's interest in the Balkans, and secure bases from which his British enemy's eastern Mediterranean outposts might be attacked. None of these reasons counted much with his soldiers, and that's pretty key. Their assaults have not been with much enthusiasm. The Greeks, whom Hitler holds, and rightly, in esteem as soldiers, have plenty of enthusiasm to defend their homeland. Also, and a big also, Turkey warns Bulgaria that the 37 Turkish divisions concentrated in the little European part of Turkey will be used if Bulgaria makes any moves on Greece. So the Greeks can start to transfer a lot of forces from Thrace to Epirus, where the Italians are wearing themselves out in frontal attacks on mountain positions. And the week comes to an end, with Italian frustration in Greece, German expansion at home, British optimism, and scattered fighting in the Atlantic and Africa. So Italy is already losing in Greece. And what does that mean for Germany? Remember, Greece is Britain's only remaining continental ally. So Hitler had thought, Okay, the Italian invasion is going to have downsides, as we saw last week, like, like when the British sent planes to Greece, making them 
theoretically soon within range of bombing those Romanian oil fields, but would have the upside of decreasing Britain's ability to challenge the Italian Libyan army. And that would help in Hitler's plans, or so he thought, to bring Spain and Vichy France into an anti-British alliance. In fact, before the Italian invasion of Greece, he was thinking of sending German forces to North Africa, even though Mussolini had said he didn't want them. But now that the Greek invasion is going badly for Italy, Germany's going to have to come to the rescue. Hitler's general Balkan policy so far this war has been to allow Italy to mostly run the relations with Yugoslavia, Albania, and Greece. Hungary and Romania are in Hitler's influence, Bulgaria not so much, but not hostile. But what now? All of that may have to change. If Germany is going to directly intervene in Greece, that will require, for example, bases in Bulgaria. And what would the Soviets think of that? I mean, if Adolf Hitler seizes territory that he and Joseph Stalin have agreed is in the Soviet sphere of influence, what will Joseph Stalin do? That was going to be my conclusion today, but it's not. On the 9th, Neville Chamberlain dies at age 71. I did talk a bit about him a few weeks ago, but I'll say a few more words here. You may fault him for the Munich Agreement or the appeasement policy with Germany, but credit where credit is due. It was because of Chamberlain in his tenure as Chancellor of the Exchequer that the RAF got the funding it needed in the 30s to have been able to this year fight the Battle of Britain. He was also a tireless and effective social reformer, which is easily overlooked, but it shouldn't be. I won't say much about him here. There are many books out there on his life and his works and not just his dealings with Germany. I will end today with Winston Churchill's eulogy for him. It's partly quoted in James Holland's The Battle of Britain. The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It is very imprudent to walk through life without this shield because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations, but with this shield, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honor. Churchill says that Neville Chamberlain always acted with complete sincerity, and he concludes the eulogy with this. Herr Hitler protests with frantic words and gestures that he has only desired peace. What do these ravings and outpourings count before the silence of Neville Chamberlain's tomb? If you'd like to see some earlier fighting in Abyssinia, you can check out our Between Two Wars episode about Mussolini's conquest in Northern Africa. It is right here. Uh, our patron of the week is Dan Lamoureux. Do like Dan and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or directly at timeghost.tv. And follow our daily coverage of the war on Instagram. Subscribe here on YouTube and I'll see you next time. <laughs>